Who are the people that got a free scamming along with their broken heart? Let's find out, starting with... Number six, their presents were requested. Japanese fraudster Takashi Maegawa ran a birthday present scam where he pretended to be in a relationship with 35 different women so they would give him birthday gifts. Mayagawa met these women while he was working as a salesperson for an undisclosed company. He let each girlfriend believe he was looking for a serious relationship and hoped to get married one day, which was probably true, just not with them. Although the women opened up to him and thought they'd formed a genuine connection, Mayagawa didn't even give them his correct birthday, which was November 13th. Instead, he told each of his girlfriends that his birthday fell on a different date. One woman thought his birthday fell on February 22nd, while another believed it was in July. His so-called romantic partners gifted Mayagawa with elaborate presents, like clothing and various items. He also accumulated roughly $1,000 from his fake birthday operation. Initially, the women were oblivious of one another's existence, but banded together when they discovered the truth and reported the scam to the authorities. The police launched an investigation into the fraud allegations against Mayagawa. His case is ongoing. Isn't this the kind of scam a toddler would run? Tell everyone it's your birthday and you get more toys, but then there's the lame girlfriend that gets you clothes instead. Obviously, she's not getting another date. Well, none of them are, but especially her. Number five, the reverse scamming. Former police chief officer Manjit Singh stole $1.27 million from her employer to send to a man she met on a dating site. Singh worked as a police officer in Malaysia before she moved to the UK. She transitioned to working for the legal office of Lay Dat and Beg in Liverpool, England. At first, she volunteered in IT and eventually became a full-time employee. Not long after she became full-time, Singh's boss, Mr. Beg, taught her how to transfer money between client and office accounts for making payments. A few years later, she met Ravi Jani on a dating website where the couple exchanged hundreds of messages and Jani confessed he was falling in love with Singh. The scammer said he worked on a rig in Dubai and constantly told her how beautiful she was and how much he cared for her. He told her he planned on looking after her and creating a life together reeling her in. It didn't take long before Janny started asking for money. At first, he just needed a few thousand dollars, but Singh sensibly said no. But as her feelings deepened, she eventually agreed. Suddenly, Janny needed money all the time. He had to cover the costs of his shipping equipment and said that once the equipment arrived, he could leave Dubai to be with her. But he never did, and the excuses continued. Janny said his rig in Dubai encountered delays, so he couldn't access his own funds and needed cash urgently. Then then he needed money for travel expenses to fly to the UK and visit Singh. And every time Singh sent him money, Jenny insisted he would pay her back once the issues were resolved. Singh needed help getting all the money to send to her online boyfriend, so turned to her workplace. She made eight transactions in less than a month. The unauthorized transactions ranged in value from $1,200 to $495,000, totaling 1.27 million bucks. Mr. Bag eventually checked the firm's business account and discovered their balance was significantly lower than expected. The account should have had $1 million, but the balance was only 50,000. Upon investigation, he uncovered that eight unauthorized transactions carried out by Singh. The transfer record showed the funds were made to an account he didn't recognize. When Bag question Singh, she said she'd accidentally made the transfers from the firm's bank account instead of her own. She also lied and told Bag that she had two and a half million dollars in her personal account. Singh also said that her partner Janny would send Bag a check with the missing money and showed her employer screenshots of a bank account that contained 2.3 million dollars. While she was with Bag, she called Janny and handed her boss the phone. Janny assured him that they would repay the funds that day. Bag decided to suspend his bank account out of caution and when he didn't receive Received the money, he called the police. Authorities attempted to trace Janny's identity using a flower delivery Singh had received at her workplace from him. They linked the delivery to an IP address in Cape Town, South Africa, but couldn't find the customer associated with the order. Lay Dat and Bag's insurance company reimbursed the firm for the unauthorized transactions. Despite getting the money back, the firm faced higher charges as a result of the incident. Bag, betrayed by his trusted employee, suffered emotional distress and depression and had to use his personal 
personal assets to guarantee payments. Singh was ultimately arrested. During her trial, she testified that she was in love with Janney and trusted him to repay her. Her lawyer added that Singh met Janney during a difficult time in her life. Her ex-husband left her while she had cancer and had a child with his new partner and her father had passed away. Although Singh scammed her employer, the judge acknowledged that she was also scammed by the man posing as Janney. She received a two-year prison sentence. And how did Mr. Bag believe Singh accidentally sent nearly a million dollars from the firm's account, mistaking it for her own account? He just accepted that she had that much money? It sounds like Mr. Bag was being a cool boss. Number four, such a classic Florida woman move. A Florida woman, Susan Rizzo, lost $25,000 to a con man she met on a dating site. We know when you heard Florida woman, you were thinking, all right, she probably did something crazy like biting an alligator or something. Everyone is insane in Florida. Unfortunately, she was scammed. The scammer posed as Nicholas Edwards, a U.S. soldier stationed in Afghanistan. The two connected on the dating platform Plenty of Fish, and over a two-month period, they exchanged phone calls and texts daily. Edwards shared stories of military missions and losses he experienced on the job, creating a connection with Rizzo. He referred to her as Cherry Blossom, and despite the distance, they seemed to share an intimate, emotional connection. Rizzo thought she was Edwards' confidant. The alleged soldier said he endured severe trauma on the job and was emotionally vulnerable. Edwards Edwards was ready to return to the U.S., but told Rizzo that military provisions required him to handle his own flight arrangements. The scammer said that he had made significant personal sacrifices to escape Afghanistan and was in a dire financial situation. He was desperate and would be stranded in the country unless Rizzo sent him money. He promised to repay her as soon as he returned to the country, and Rizzo believed him. Why wouldn't she? So she reluctantly deposited $25,000 into his bank account. But then Edwards immediately asked for another $3,000 bringing Rizzo to the painful realization that she was being conned. She shared her story, hoping to get her money back and to warn others. Number three, I'm a mogul. K.O. De Silva posed as a successful music producer to con multiple women out of $338,000. The Brazilian scammer met his victims on dating platforms like Tinder to establish romantic relationships with women. He had multiple accounts under different names and said he was a successful producer and composer in Brazil's country music scene. De Silva took the women on extravagant dinner dates to restaurants where he appeared to be well-connected and always picked up the check. He introduced his victims to his family, including including his children, which convinced the women they were growing closer to the wealthy executive. Shortly into each relationship, De Silva would say he was experiencing financial difficulties, like being locked out of his bank account or needing to cover emergency expenses. He then asked the women for money and promised to pay them back. Since he had created the illusion that he was wealthy, the women believed him and gave out the loans. As it turns out, De Silva had a previous criminal conviction for embezzlement, which he committed before his romance scam. One of his victims was Talita Silva, a lawyer. They matched on Tinder, where his profile caught her attention. He seemed to be someone that wanted a serious and committed relationship rather than something casual. During their relationship, De Silva repeatedly asked for money. He said he couldn't access his bank account and asked if he could use her credit card. Talita covered $9,900 of his purchases and helped him out with a $4,000 fine he allegedly received on his farm. He kept asking for money, and when she stopped giving it to him, she noticed an instant change in his behavior. So she confronted him and he eventually repaid the $9,900. Sadly, his eight other victims were not as lucky. Many of them didn't get their money back, and at least one of them feared for her life. At the time of this video, De Silva is the headliner in five separate investigations. You probably shouldn't have tried to scam a lawyer, Kayo. Number two, feeling loved. British mother, Sharon Bulmer, lost more than $100,000 to a catfish. A con artist who went by the name Murphy Townsend contacted Bulmer on Facebook. He said he was a 56-year-old U.S. soldier stationed in Syria and that he had been watching her profile, which is a really creepy thing to say to someone, isn't it? After exchanging a few messages, Bulmer gave him her email and they moved to Google Hangouts. Bulmer believed Townsend had a 17-year-old daughter and that he had recently lost his wife. He talked about his loneliness, and said that he just wanted someone to talk to. Over a period of two and a half years, the 51-year-old mother of two sent Townsend over $100,000. But Bulmer didn't realize that the catfish's photos were actually Latvia's Minister of Defense, Artis Paybrix. Despite the Latvian Defense Office's attempts at removing accounts with Paybrick's image, Townsend's Facebook account was one of hundreds of catfish profiles that used the Minister of Defense's photos. Sadly, Bulmer was so invested that she ended her 29 
year-long relationship with her partner to pursue a relationship with Townsend. Despite their connection, Townsend would grow agitated whenever Bulmer asked him questions about his life. He would refuse to give her answers, and when he did, they would be vague ones. Additionally, he said he wasn't allowed to make video calls at his army base, so she left a 29-year relationship for a guy she never even video called and who got mad when she asked basic questions about him. It's like the red flags had red flags. After speaking every day, Townsend finally asked if he could visit Balmer in Manchester, England. Of course, she said yes. But then he said there was one problem. He was having financial issues. He asked her to send him money to pay for his flight and asked that she use Bitcoin, which she said was the safest way to handle the funds. After a few days without communication, Balmer finally received a message from a different email address, but under Murphy Townsend's name. The sender asked for an additional $19,000 for the flight, which she paid. At the end of the month, someone posing as a doctor contacted her to say that Townsend was in the hospital. They said that he was unconscious, but would be okay. She didn't ask for more details and didn't contact Townsend until he messaged her weeks later. He wanted to know why she hadn't reached out to him sooner, and she said that she believed she was scammed by someone using his email address. Townsend seemed shocked. He told her that he was shot on his way to the airport and would need to be in the hospital for six more weeks. He also said he couldn't return to the army base as he lied and told them he was returning to his family in the US rather than flying to meet Balmer in the UK. He said he lost his computer during the fighting, confirming what Balmer had assumed, that someone had stolen his computer. Townsend said he needed $6,300 for his medical bills, which Balmer paid. Once he had the money, he announced that he would leave the army for good and move to Manchester with her. But before the move, he would have to return to the US to sort a few things out and prepare to bring his daughter to the UK. He said he was dealing with administration fees, airlifting fees, and fines for ending his contract early and began asking Balmer for money on a weekly basis. Although she hoped he was the man she fell in love with, Balmer finally grew suspicious of him. When she asked him to send her pictures, he sent a screenshot of photos from the Facebook profile of Mike Douglas. So she asked him to send her pictures in his uniform. He sent over more pictures through the Mike Douglas account, and when she challenged him, he said they couldn't use Facebook when he was on a mission. The scammer also said that someone hacked his original Facebook, which is why the name on it changed. Finally, Bulmer wanted proof of his injuries from his hospital stay. He sent her a copy of a letter signed by a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. The dates also didn't correspond with when he told her he was in the hospital. Bulmer eventually contacted the U.S. Army to ask if anyone named Murphy Townsend was serving. They confirmed that nobody under that name was serving in the Army Reserve or as a general officer. She also learned that the 37th Infantry Brigade Combat Team, he said to be a part of, was from the Ohio National Guard, not the Army Army Reserve. Balmer eventually confronted the scammer, armed with new information, to which he responded, Are you dumb? And that was the end of that. When all was said and done, Balmer ended up $47,000 in debt. How brutal was that? Balmer had lost everything. Money, a relationship, self-worth, and then was called dumb to cap it all off. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned right here to find out how she hunted down her romance scammer. Number one, just wait a couple years. Dimitrios Limberatos, a convicted former pharmacist, spent the days leading up to his prison sentence looking for love on Tinder. Limberatos' legal issues stemmed from his New York-based pharmacy business. The DEA discovered discrepancies in his pharmacy's application regarding controlled substances and opened an investigation into his business practices. Limberato responded by sending a greeting card filled with a controlled powdered substance to one of his investigators' homes, which resulted in additional charges of obstruction of justice. He's just full of good ideas, isn't he? Limberatos pleaded guilty to charges of conspiracy to commit health care fraud, conspiracy to commit money laundering, and obstruction of justice. He also admitted that he committed his crimes while under the influence. Limberatos received a three-year federal prison sentence and was required to report to prison on July 24th, 2023. Before his sentence began, Limberatos created a Tinder profile in which he openly disclosed his upcoming federal prison term. In his bio, he emphasized that he was being honest and not hiding anything, encouraging anyone interested to message him. Despite wearing an ankle monitor and adhering to a court-appointed curfew, Limberatos went on a few dates with some of the people who he met through Tinder. Maybe he'll even keep talking to some of them now that he's in prison. After all, since he's honest about his situation, he would be a much better person to date than a real romance scammer. You never do anything spontaneous. Those were the words spoken to the then 36-year-old Acacia Windnot by her friend before she went on a date with Wilson Jackson, the man 
who would consume the next few years of her life for all the wrong reasons. Weedenot's life truly changed when she received a friend request and a follow-up Facebook message from Jackson. On the surface, Jackson seemed like a genuine guy. He wore nice clothes in his pictures, and they even shared four mutual friends. His expression on the photos oozed charm, intelligence, and confidence. Jackson's message was, What's up, beautiful? Confirm these impressions. What's up, beautiful? Wasn't an uncommon first message for We Do Not to find in her DMs. It's a message that she's used to getting. Nevertheless, Jackson stuck out like a well-dressed, confident thumb. To his, What's up, beautiful? We Do Not responded with a suspicious, Hello. But it was enough to get a response from Jackson. He continued the Facebook message convo with We Do Not for several weeks before asking her on a date. During those weeks, We Do Not became close to Jackson. She found out he wasn't a catfish after they FaceTimed on a few occasions. They spoke on the phone, talking about their mutual love of sports, particularly football. Jackson asked her about the nine years she served in the Air Force, and We Do Not answered, telling him all about her time abroad. Jackson listened to every word. In fact, We Do Not got the impression that he cared about her, especially when he offered to fly Weedonot from her home in Scottsdale, Arizona, out to his house in LA for Christmas. Weedonot's original plans were to spend Christmas with her best friend, but the plans were cancelled at the last minute. Now, left with no holiday plans, Weedonot was still on the fence about accepting Jackson's offer. This was not something she'd normally do. Weedonot's friend eventually convinced her to let Jackson buy her a ticket to LA and finally do something spontaneous. We did not packed her things and left for the airport. Earlier, Jackson sent We Do Not a screenshot of the boarding pass he'd bought for her. Everything seemed to be in order. Not to mention, We Do Not had finally found someone she liked who could meet her expectations. However, when she got to the airport, employees said her ticket was invalid. We Do Not, assuming something must have gone wrong during the purchasing process, called Jackson to get things sorted out. But when Jackson answered the phone, he didn't offer a solution. Instead, he insisted the ticket must be valid. We Do Not explained that the flight would leave soon and she needed a ticket to LA pronto. So Jackson instructed We Do Not to buy a ticket at the airport. He promised to pay her back when she got to LA and to prove something was going on with the ticket he initially bought, Jackson sent We Do Not screenshots of him dealing with the bank. We Do Not says she proceeded to buy a ticket to LA and boarded the plane. Her plane landed at LAX in the late hours of the night. Jackson picked her up and took her to the movies. We Do Not recalls how he was in person, just as charming, fun, and kind as he seemed on FaceTime. Jackson asked her about We Do Not's future, her career aspirations, and any wild, crazy dreams she harbored. In the morning, like a true gentleman, he cooked her breakfast, a classic combination of bacon and eggs. After they ate breakfast, Jackson took We Do Not back to the airport. On Monday, her second full day back home, We Do Not noticed over $3,000 was missing from her bank account. We Do Not scanned her card's transaction history and discovered where the purchases were made. The largest transaction was a $2,500 transfer to another account, the other two payments for a plane ticket and items at a fast food restaurant. All the money charges were billed from California. We Do Not knew exactly who had used her card. So, not long after seeing the charges, We Do Not filed a police report against Jackson. She wanted Jackson apprehended as soon as possible. Unfortunately, the police didn't share her desire for revenge. When We Do Not called the Scottsdale police, they deferred her to the Los Angeles police, who boomeranged We Do Not right back to Scottsdale police, telling her she'd have to file her report with them. Most people would give up, as $3,000 might not be a big deal. But We Do Not didn't care about the money. Instead of moving on, We Do Not started her own investigation into Jackson. Jackson had already blocked her number, so asking her suspect questions over the phone was not an option. With no prior background in research, We Do Not began investigating Jackson. She started with the basics. Where did Jackson live? Even though she'd been to his house, We Do Not couldn't remember Jackson's address, and without his address, finding Jackson would be very difficult. She couldn't find any home addresses linked to the purchases on her bank statement, but she did find the address of the fast food restaurant. After finding the restaurant address, We Do Not searched every apartment complex in the area, and with the help of her memory, found the apartment complex she stayed at with Jackson. She remembered Jackson taking her to a tall building, so tall that they had to park in an underground parking garage. So, We Do Not narrowed her search to tall apartment buildings with underground garages. She also remembered being close to a movie theater on a noisy LA street. Using these very specific criteria, We Do Not found a potential match. Just to be sure it was the building she stayed at, the rookie sleuth looked up the floor plans, then based on her memory of walking through the rooms and hallways, determined this was the place. We Do Not called the building's phone number and asked the clerk if a resident named Will Jackson lived there. 
The clerk said no, and we had not felt a dreadful epiphany wash over her. Will Jackson was not his real name. We did not keep digging. She used methods she initially learned from MTV's Catfish, such as reverse Google image searches on Jackson's Facebook page. Eventually, one of those reverse searches yielded a link to a social media account under a different name. The account had an email written in the bio. We did not dug deeper into the email account and discovered it belonged to someone named Sincere Jackson. We did not kept digging and Googled the name. The results were mostly unrelated, except for one article. The article was small, only 85 words, but it contained some vital info on Jackson. Oddly enough, the article's publisher was from Orlando, a local paper called the West Orlando News. In 2011, the Orlando News published an article on Jackson, saying that the police department were searching for victims willing to come forward and testify against Jackson. Alongside the victim's story was a mugshot of Jackson, who we do not easily recognized. The real question was, who are these victims? And what did Jackson do to them? Was it similar to what he did to her? Detective Weedonaut would soon find out. In 2007, a Florida woman who gave reporters the alias Shonda Porter dated Jackson. She described him as a snake who could shed his skin on command and become anyone he needed to be. But that isn't how Jackson saw himself. Porter dated Jackson long enough to notice a large tattoo on his back written in bold, daring letters, Outlaw. Weedonaut would later discover after some more online sleuthing, that Jackson grew up as anything but an outlaw. According to public records, Jackson was born in Daytona Beach, Florida. Contrary to his tattoo, Jackson was raised in a conservative Christian household. Growing up, he did everything he could to escape his family's culture. As a young man, Jackson attempted to start a rap career under the name Da Truth. However, Da Truth wasn't very good. Jackson spent his early years bouncing around Florida, mainly between Tallahassee and Orlando, all the while claiming to his many girlfriends he was playing football and writing bars. In reality, Jackson was learning how to scam people, specifically successful young women on social media and dating apps. These girls saw Jackson the same way we do not had. Handsome, well-dressed, tall, fit-looking man with charm to impress even the most skeptical women. He used these attributes to lure dozens of women into trusting him. After contacting other victims and hearing their stories, we do not discovered Jackson's operation. She also realized how similar her story was to other victims. On a basic level, all the other victims, including We Do Not, had a few common experiences. They were contacted by Jackson, usually online, talked with him for a while, then he asked them for a favor or some kind of big purchase with the promise of reimbursement, after which Jackson would either not pay them back or steal their bank information and disappear, seemingly without a trace, until he met We Do Not, of course. She was the only victim who cared enough to track him down. In fact, no one did more than her in finding so-called Will Jackson, whose birth name was Wilson Edward Jackson. However, he used the name Sincere often, which is why we did not had such a tough time finding him. But when she did, we did not finally saw how extensive Jackson's scamming truly was. Before she continued her research on the other victims, we did not contacted a professional. Then, 55-year-old LAPD detective Stephanie Kratzscher, by 2018, when we had not reached out to her, Detective Kratzscher had been investigating Jackson for a while, ever since the charming scam artist had moved to LA back in 2014. We had not could not arrest Jackson herself, but Kratzscher could. The Scottsdale sleuth presented Kratzscher with all the evidence she collected so far and convinced the LA detective that Jackson needed to be arrested immediately. Kratzscher, however, had a lot on her plate. The city of Angels was filled with scamming demons and small-scale scams like Jackson's were not a number one priority. Nevertheless, the overworked and overwhelmed detective promised we not she would arrest Jackson as soon as possible. We did not hung up the phone feeling confident that Kratzscher would take care of the arrest. In the meantime, however, we not could not let the case go. So far, Kratzscher only had eight victims who'd reported Jackson to the authorities. We did not was determined to find more. We did not got to work quickly. She started using the very app Jackson used to contact her to look for other victims in Florida and California. The posts worked, and we did not started talking to several other victims from the two states. She even put them in touch with one another, creating a network of Jackson victims who could talk about their experiences. Crash Year found eight victims during years of investigation. We did not found 10 victims in just one month. These women, mostly African-American in their 30s, told each other how Jackson humiliated them. Though many of the victims shared their stories with other victims, most were reluctant to give their names to the media out of embarrassment. They all wanted to see some form of justice, though. Crash your promise we'd not an arrest. 
with the deadline being April 2018. But after traveling to Afghanistan for a few months to work as a civilian air traffic controller, we do not looked at the calendar and noticed the month was January. The year? 2019. We do not, in her extensive research, remembered reading how Jackson had gotten away. Most of the escapes were made possible by lazy investigators and prosecutors. We do not couldn't let another detective leave him under a pile of other cases. So she gave Crashier an ultimatum. Arrest Jackson, or we do not would file a complaint on the veteran detective who was set to retire any day now. Crashier chose the harder option and looked up Jackson on her computer. She found a warrant in his name for Grand Theft Auto and sent a team of officers to bring him in. Jackson was arrested on May 23, 2019 in Los Angeles. He was taken into police custody and hired a lawyer, but the lawyer left after Jackson's check bounced. His public defender convinced him to plead not guilty despite over 60 women coming forward to testify against him on 33 felony charges. In total, Jackson is believed to have collected over $200,000 from his victims victims, including Weed Knot. Sadly, they'll never get that money back. But they can enjoy knowing that Jackson's face and reputation were smeared across news media outlets like Newsweek, The Daily Beast, and several local LA outlets. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section whether or not you think there would ever be a situation where it makes sense to send money to someone on a dating app that you've never met before.